Today, let us take some time to study the sermon entitled God's Distressed Heart. Through the Bible, let us understand how distressed and anxious God's heart is for us. First, let us take a look at God's Word in the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 49. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. As shown in this verse, God expressed His distressed heart while he was waiting for the result of the Gospel to be displayed. We can understand how sad and anxious God must have been thinking of the salvation of mankind when he said, How distressed I am. Let's take a look at the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 30. It says, I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus encountered a situation where the Jews tried to stone him. Jesus testified that he is God, but the Jews strongly opposed his word. Two thousand years ago, the Jews did not recognize God Almighty and even tried to stone him. In this age, there are also many people in the world who do not recognize God Almighty. The scene written in John chapter 10 verse 30 depicted God's distressed heart when people who claim to believe in God did not acknowledge God's holy existence in the flesh. That is why Jesus said, How distressed I am. This is one of the scenes where God shows His grieved heart about those who did not recognize God who came in the flesh. Even Philip, a disciple of Jesus, did not recognize Jesus as God in the flesh, causing him to feel distressed. Let's go to John chapter 14 to see how Jesus answered Philip. When we read the Gospel of John chapter 14 verse 6, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Disciple Philip even said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, Philip asked, What do you mean? Jesus said, I am the Father, who is speaking with you now, aren't I? During his ministry, many people did not realize that Jesus was God who came to the earth in the flesh. Many types of people, including slanderers, and even his disciples failed to recognize him. That is why Jesus expressed his anxiety and grief towards them by saying, How distressed I am. Now, let's see God's word in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 3. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. 
Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. If the teachers of the law had realized Jesus was God, wouldn't they have naturally accepted his words, Your sins are forgiven? Since they did not realize that Jesus was God Almighty, they thought to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? Only God alone can forgive our sins. How can this mere carpenter, Jesus of Nazareth, say, Your sins are forgiven? Reading this verse, we can find a very important point. Although Jesus is God Almighty, who came to this earth in the flesh, to the people who recognized him, it is so natural for him to say, Your sins are forgiven. Doesn't Jesus have this kind of authority? This is why he said in verse 10, You may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Since God alone can forgive our sins, doesn't this confirm that Jesus is God? However, the people at that time did not acknowledge that Jesus was God, but opposed what he said by exclaiming, Only God can do such work. How dare you say you can do it? Can you imagine how troubled Jesus must have been, thinking, I can certainly do this, but why do you insist I cannot? Today, we see many similar situations like this in our life of faith. Our God is omniscient and omnipotent. We know that in Him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. When God looked at the people who mistreated Him without realizing who He was, how grieved must He have been? Jesus might have thought if the fire of the gospel of the new covenant were kindled all around the world and everyone accepted the truth, they would recognize who I am. Even though He has the authority to forgive sins, they persecuted Him for it, even though He is God who came in the flesh. They mocked Him, since they did not believe in Him, how distressed He must have been. The way people perceive the Holy Spirit and the Bride in this age is no different than how people perceived Jesus 2,000 years ago. When God sees the people in this age, how distressed must they be? God has come to this earth and has given us a lot of courage and talent, saying, Go and preach in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I will give you the ability to carry it out. Since God has already given us this promise and mission, we shouldn't think, Can I really fulfill it? Is this even possible? We should never waver nor doubt what God has promised us. God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and He governs the whole universe. Then, He can definitely control everything that is happening on a small planet called Earth. If not, how can we say that God governs the whole universe, the world, that is beyond our imagination? It is written in the Bible that everything is insignificant in the eyes of God, since the gospel work is only being done in this global village and it is not burdensome, God says, My children, why don't you try doing this small task? When you complete preaching the gospel in Samaria and to the ends of the earth and enter the kingdom of heaven, won't the heavenly hosts and angels deem you as worthy of becoming the honorable royal priesthood? God did not ask us to preach to billions of people in the vast universe. Because of God's grace, He has asked us to only preach the gospel on this tiny earth, which is insignificant in the eyes of God. However, people on earth 
do not recognize who God is. They do not understand God's power, nor do they acknowledge who He is. When God said He would give us the forgiveness of sins, people responded, Is this even possible? Will our sins really be forgiven? When God said, Receive the Holy Spirit, they said, Will the Holy Spirit really come upon us? Since they did not recognize God, those who did not believe regarded His words as meaningless and complete nonsense when He said, You will be with me in paradise. Nevertheless, the robber on his right side was able to enter this glorious place of paradise with Jesus. We should ask ourselves, what faith should we have while doing the gospel in the age of the Holy Spirit, so that the door for the gospel will be opened wide? And when it does, leading 3,000 or even 5,000 people in a day will no longer be considered a miracle. Instead, it will be an everyday occurrence. God's children should realize this. God feels extremely distressed because of people's lack of realization and failure to recognize God. Let's take a look at God's Word in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verse 13. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about 11 kilometers from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? Do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but did not find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. How distressed must Jesus have felt! He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. As Jesus walked to a village called Emmaus with his two disciples named Luke and Cleopas, he grew distressed and said, I prophesied many times through the prophets that I must suffer and rise from the dead. How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Let's continue with verse 26. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. They could not recognize Jesus until he broke bread with them and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? Just as those who recognized God had such burning hearts within them. We, who are now serving God the Father and God the Mother, who came in the flesh, can have burning hearts within us. What is the difference between knowing and not knowing God the Father and God the Mother. Some only understand God as knowledge, and others can transform their knowledge into faith. Even though God came in the flesh and was temporarily made lower than the angels, it does not mean that the flesh made him powerless. He could forgive sins with authority in heaven and on earth. He said to the robber on his right side, who was dying helplessly, Today you will be with me in paradise. 
With these simple words, he opened the way of salvation to the robber. What good is it for a man if he studies the Bible to a great extent, yet does not receive God in the flesh? He retains knowledge, but commits the foolish act of not having faith in God. God is the one who can come to the earth and forgive sins. Even when he puts on the flesh, Christ could have spoken in a simpler way. But to show his mighty power, even in the flesh, to the Pharisees and Sadducees, he spoke in a more complex way, saying, Your sins are forgiven. In other words, he chose a more complicated way to let them know that the Son of Man has authority on this earth to forgive sins and to save mankind. Everyone, can you imagine how distressed God was about this matter? We should not take the fact that God the Creator of the heavens, the earth and all things as just knowledge. Not having faith, we should have faith like Apostles Peter, John, James and Paul. Is there anything we should fear in this world when God is with us and gives us the abilities? This is why God is distressed, asking, Do I look powerless in your eyes? Do I look like God who cannot even grant you the forgiveness of sins? How distressed I am! Jesus asked the two disciples on their way to a mouse, What do the Scriptures say? How slow of heart are you to believe all that the prophets have spoken? Doesn't it say that God had to rise from the dead on the third day? Then, shouldn't Christ be resurrected from the dead in three days? Why do you regard my death as shocking? Why do you think that it should not have happened? As for us, we must believe that He is God, who fulfills everything in the Bible. God was distressed because people did not recognize God or understand His authority and power. In the time of the early church, the unfortunate situation when no one understood God's power or recognized Him frequently occurred. However, there was a situation that pleased God. Let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Even Luke and Cleopas, the two disciples who were on their way to a mouse, described Jesus as a prophet who was powerful in words and deeds. That was their opinion about Jesus. Let's continue with verse 15. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In the life of Jesus, full of distress, Peter gave the best answer. Let us continue with verse 17. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. With our mouths and lips we say, God is omniscient and omnipotent. But when we hear, God forgives our sins and pours out the Holy Spirit, we find it difficult to believe. People think, if God pours down the Holy Spirit, we should feel a tingling sensation in our hearts, but we feel the same as usual. Even though God says, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on you, they wonder, is that true? Have we really received the Holy Spirit? When God declares, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on you, if the words are written in the Bible of the age of the Holy Spirit, the heavenly angels will believe without a doubt that God has given the Holy Spirit that day at that hour. 
the children who believe God's word fervently preach the gospel in Samaria and to the ends of the earth after they received the Holy Spirit. However, God feels distressed if someone says, Amen, simply because everyone else says so, not knowing whether they received the Holy Spirit or not. Who spoke these words? It was God, right? Having knowledge and transforming knowledge into faith are two completely different actions. We should never think that sermon was given to us last week and that same sermon is given again. Since some members do not yet fully know who God is, they may have a reaction like this. However, those who know God will not think in this manner. Let's think about the man named Zacchaeus. When God said that he would come to his house, didn't he regard it as great honour for his family? What about Mary? She poured precious, expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. Why did she have such a sincere attitude towards Jesus? It was because she believed Jesus was God. Since God came to the earth to save the world and granted us many missions for our salvation, we should always give the answer as clear as that of Peter who recognized Jesus as God and said to him, Lord, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let us turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Let's read from verse 65. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? When Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him, from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Those who followed him simply thought, Oh, Jesus is remarkable. He is different from other people. However, they all eventually turned back. When it comes to following Jesus, the number of followers does not matter. What matters is having faith. Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We can never leave you. From the beginning, those who correctly recognized the nature of Jesus knew him and graciously kept their faith towards him. They thought, Jesus is Almighty God, who created the heavens and the earth. Whatever he does must contain his great will, so we will follow him even to the point of death. In this age, we should engrave this kind of mindset on our hearts once again. We should learn the lesson through the examples of the Jews who slandered him, the people who did not recognize Jesus, and the people who momentarily followed him and turned back. In other words, those who turned back were the ones who were baptized but did not keep their faith until the end. They caused God to be distressed. God says, when you finish the race, you will see the glorious kingdom of heaven. You will be amazed by the magnificent future that will unfold before your very eyes. How could you easily throw away the splendid glory by being preoccupied with this temporary and sinful world? Isn't this our God who gave us these promises? However, they do not recognize who God is, nor His power. They do not realize the capacity of God who is able to fulfill everything. The unfaithful behavior of being preoccupied with this sinful world comes from not knowing God. We should never follow the footsteps of those who lived 2,000 years ago, should we? It was written, God explained what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Then, through the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verse 6, let us see how the Bible testifies about God who appears in this age. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, 
the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of His people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in Him and He saved us. As we can see, the book of Isaiah chapter 25 precisely testifies about our God who will appear in the age of the Holy Spirit who is the one who will swallow up our death forever through the aged wine. The Bible says, Surely this is our God. We trusted in Him and He saved us. We should not expect anyone else except God to save us. Through the Word of God in the Bible, we can confirm once again that salvation depends only on our God, who comes in the order of Melchizedek to destroy death forever with the aged wine. Even to the two disciples going to Emmaus, Jesus explained what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. After that, their eyes were opened to recognize him. Who is the one that has granted us the forgiveness of sins and destroyed death forever by giving us the bread and wine of the New Covenant's Passover? that had been abolished since AD 325? Isn't it Christ An Sang Hong? Isn't it our Heavenly Mother, New Jerusalem? Now the Spirit and the Bride are leading us to salvation. We should regard God who established and is leading this Church as the source and the centre of all powers and authority of this Church. Only then, wouldn't we be able to confidently believe that the Church of God is the Church that will never fail but will enter the eternal Kingdom of Heaven? Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 22. In chapter 22 verse 17 it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. It is said that in the last days, the Spirit and the Bride would appear and lead all of us. The Church that the Holy Spirit and the Bride, God the Father and God the Mother are now leading is the Church of God. No matter how many evil rumours there may be to destroy the Church of God, will they be successful? No, the Church of God will never fail. Who is our God? Even amid slanders, God is proceeding with this gospel work silently yet powerfully. Brothers and sisters, God is continuously searching our hearts and minds to see with what mindset we are carrying out this gospel work. Isn't our gospel predestined to be fulfilled and accomplished without fail? If we start our gospel journey without realizing this matter, we will soon get weary. If we do not understand that God is the one who is leading this gospel, God will be distressed. Our God is true God who has the authority to forgive sins. When He says, your sins are forgiven, His word is effective immediately. If He says, I have poured down upon you the power of the Holy Spirit, everything in the whole universe will respond to His voice. When we believe this fact and obey God's words, we will have gracious and prosperous results on any path God leads us. We must believe that Jesus is God. We must also believe in Elohim God, our father and mother, who came in the order of Melchizedek in this age of the Holy Spirit. For the rest of our lives, let us try our best to fully understand God's distressed heart so that we can have faith like Peter, who was able to comfort God. Furthermore, we should be the ones who can follow God wherever they lead us and enter the eternal Kingdom of Heaven. Thank you very much.